Oh, thank you. Didn't write that down. Uh, a new partner this year is uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of uh, North Carolina Foundation, so we're happy to have them. Uh, returning partner is uh, Raleigh for You, it's the Raleigh Economic Development folks. Uh, another new partner is Innovate Carolina, uh, and then we've got our um, my employer Red Hat. So I thank them for their for letting me be here as well. Uh, additional partners include Data.World. Um, if you are here for the Open Data Competition, we've got some really cool stuff uh, on the Data.World portal. Uh, we've got a, a, a team of folks collecting a bunch of data that goes into some of the challenges we'll, you'll hear about later on. Uh, we have IPRIO. They're in the, uh, the Raleigh's largest fintech company. Fintech, got to know the lingo. Um, we have All Things Open. This is the uh, large open source conference that's happen happening October 22nd, 23rd at the Raleigh Convention Center. Uh, we're hoping to have 3,000 people at that event this year. Uh, Todd Lewis will be here tomorrow to give you more information about that. Uh, we have another new partner, Pendo. Uh, HQ Raleigh, we give, let's give a pause here and give a huge shout out to HQ Raleigh for hosting the space and for being a great partner. <laughs> Special shout out to Natalie, who is like super organized marketing person. So, all right, uh, almost done here. Uh, we've got the Raleigh main events. That's like this collective of all the cool stuff happening in Raleigh during the month of September or around September. Um, so, you know, things like uh, Hopscotch, SparkCon, City Camp, all those cool kids. Uh, we've got the NC State Pool College of Management, the Entrepreneurship Clinic. So uh, Lewis Sheets uh, runs that program, and so if you see him asking more about that, uh, we've got Reveal Mobile, who's uh, got some some goodies for us on the uh, on the hackathon side. We'll test out on Saturday, and then our uh, final partner is Elastic IO. So uh, give a round of applause to all of our partners, please. So, a couple things. I um, want to thank all of the volunteers. So, like I mentioned, we've been, uh, we all volunteer. Anyone who's uh, a planner is volunteering for this. Uh, we are not getting paid. We do this because we are really passionate about uh, the mission of open government and open data. And uh, so, if you see a person in a blue, volunt a blue shirt like this, uh, please tell them thank you. Uh, if you'd like to give them a hug, please make sure it's consensual. <laughs> And then uh, lastly, let's see, uh, I want to thank all of our speakers. We have an amazing group of speakers here tonight. Uh, all of them have volunteered their time. Fun fact, all of the speakers got their slides in on schedule. So I don't know if, <laughs> if anyone has ever organized speakers, that is a pain in the butt to, uh, to get wrangling. So I officially changed my status on Tuesday to slide Wrangler and check the box successful. <laughs> so uh, we've got a great lineup for you tonight. We're going to try something brand new this year. Uh, hopefully you've read about it when you signed up. We're going to do the world's first ever mega lightning talk. Oh, is it on here? Yeah, we'll come back to you. Um, <laughs> we think this is the first, first world's first ever mega lightning talk. So what we've done is when we had the submission process, we actually had uh, these amazing four open data program managers submit kind of a similar talk or, or a similar theme. So we said, hey, why don't you guys just do it together? And they're like, okay. <laughs> so, uh, so we're going to give it a try. We're going to give them 20 minutes. Uh, they're going to talk about the state of open data. I'll let Aaron, Aaron introduce those folks to you. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to bring up our lovely MC for the evening. Uh, she does local stand-up comedy. She's a performer and a producer. Her latest production is Eyes Up Here Comedy. Aaron Terry for the rest of the night. Y'all keep it on for Jason Hibbets. Thanks for the time. Yeah. I don't do slides. I don't have any slides. So uh, I did pay attention to the code of conduct, which means I'm not going to be mean to anybody like I would if I was doing stand-up, because I don't want to get escorted out of here. Um, but you guys, we have our first sub, um, Mega Lightning Talk, coined, I think, and trademarked by Jason Hibbett. So if you guys give a warm round, welcome, round of applause to Bonnie Brown with the city of Raleigh, Daniel Dunn with the town of Chapel Hill, Sam McClinney with the city and county of Durham, and Ben Strauss of Wake County. Yeah, and so we're going to just kind of go one by one here and uh, each talk about 
what we had originally planned to, and then at the end, I think we're each going to take 30 seconds and kind of give a brief call about what we think people should think about as far as open data going forward. So my talk, uh, Welcome to Open Data 2.0, I think is a good start because it kind of covers a lot of what they're going to cover, just thinking about open data past the idea of transparency. So in the past, open data was very much seen as a product raw and unfiltered, and was just think, uh, seen as just kind of this thing we put out there for the effort of transparency, and that was it. You know, we weren't really looking at it as much as what we could use it for, and it was just saying, here, residents, here you go, here's what we have. Um, and now it's something different. It's a service. It's curated. We're thinking about what can we use this data for besides just people using it as a transparency tool. And so, um, what is Open Data 2.0? It's thinking about things as open by default, something very common in open source. You know, it's agile, responsive, and holistic. You know, it benefits not just residents, but also departments. Um, within the city and county of Durham, we're thinking of how can we use open data to improve the services we offer. And then it's founded on the idea that education is key. Using open data to benefit what we're doing as kind of an organization. Now, how do we do this? There's three parts. The first is an identity shift. One, document everything. Um, you know, what you don't want is to ever try and reinvent the wheel or repeat effort. And so always document stuff. Align your goals with other departments. So what are other departments doing where open data can benefit them in making sure we're doing that? Uh, visualizations and dashboards. One thing the city of Durham did and the county actually recently was we released our resident survey data and we had an individual who put that into a dashboard that could then be broken down by race, gender, income, and so we can find groups that aren't receiving services as well as others are. And finally, communication is key. Um, when you talk about data, often the problem isn't data itself, but how we're talking about it. And so to make sure that we're talking about data in the correct way is really important. Next, capacity building. Uh, one thing I try to do in my job is partner with innovative and strategic departments. Um, create your tribe of internal data stakeholders. That's hugely important. And then data skills building and analytics. One thing we're doing um, in the city and county of Durham and also Jason and I have been working on um, with Greensboro is we're both starting a data academy in October where we're inviting employees to come in and build their data skills. And within the first two weeks, I know at least in Durham, we had 60 employees within the city and county apply to that. And so we're hoping to offer that going forward. And then finally, I think this is the most important part, um, grow external partnerships and community engagement. This is a picture of actually, I think, the kickoff to Open Pass for Civic Spark Day in Durham, where we brought together 50 to 60 people and just talked about how can the public, you know, how can local government and then how can residents and private <coughs> organizations partner together to create more beneficial relationships? And that kind of goes along with direct external outreach. And then, um, and I think this is, this was not intentional when I wrote this, but now that we're doing this, it kind of works. Collaborate with other open data programs. So, Mega Lightning Talks, <laughs> Data Academy with Greensboro, you know, we're no longer alone. There's so many open data programs, and part of, I'd say maybe 10% of my job is spent talking to other open data program managers, I feel like. And the work we're doing together is amazing, and it's only going to keep getting better as both the number of open data programs grows, and also as we start thinking past this idea of silos and realize that collaborating within, within organizations can lead to this end product that's much better than if we'd done it by ourselves. And so, Here's my information, it'll also be on the last slide, and thank you very much. And then, bye. So my slides were on time because I don't have any. Uh, so my name is Molly Brown, I'm the Enterprise Data Manager for the City of Raleigh, and we kind of take care of three things. We deal with all of the database and infrastructure side of things. We do internal reporting, so all of the analytics for the whole city, really. Um, so we work with every department, all 19 departments. And then we have the open data program. So we have three different pieces all being managed under the same small group, two-fourths of which are here today, so I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk to you about data's life story. So in 2017, IBM had an article where they talked about um, data without a story is like a palette without painting. So it's a little esoteric, I know, but really, if I handed you a palette of paint and I was like, that's an awesome blue, they're like, yeah, it's blue, whatever. Um, but if I painted it in the night sky, you'd be like, oh my god, that's fantastic. And <laughs> it's the same 
same thing with data, right? So I could hand you a big thing of data with no insight and no information, and be like, all that data is awesome, but what does it mean? What does it do? And then in 2016, there was an article by Forbes, and they talked about how data storytelling needs to be part of the data scientist toolkit, an essential part of the data scientist toolkit. So funny, I thought it was about R and making cool visualizations and you know likes and retweets and but really it's about being meaningful and having action come to play. And then way back in 2011, do something.org tweeted that data, excuse me, uh, it says no good data without a story and no good story without data. So that totally makes sense to me, right? You can't just put out a million records and be like, go figure it out, right? We need to give some context and, and some method and place with that. So that's really what we're looking at now, because what is the point of us amassing all these millions of records of data and making them public if we're not giving you any context? So you have no idea what filters have been applied. You don't know why things are categorized the way they are. And you're going off and doing your own analysis on our data without any story to go along with it. So that's kind of the big change for us. And we can use the example if you look at the census data. Anybody can go out and grab the 2010 and 2014 census data and start doing comparisons. But what does it mean together? Right? Do you know that if you look at the increase in income as it relates to the increase in block population and education and rent, do you know how those things relate together? And do you know what the city is doing by looking at that information? And I think that's a really big shift and change for us in our open data is to not just share with you the data, but also share with you what we're doing with the data, the insights that we've derived from it, and really sharing that with the public. So we have sort of our data story is about the data, the visualization, and the narrative. So not just putting out those data sets. Don't worry, we'll still put them out there, right? I know my friends are like, to download all that stuff and do all the cool things, don't worry, you can still do that. But we're gonna supplement that and give you the story and context that the city is using that data. So it's not just about a million records, but it's a million records that tell us to do something else. And so our data program was launched in like 2012, and it was strictly focused on just getting stuff out there. So we have over 200 data sets out there, mostly data sets and maps, and not a lot of in-between. So we're making a big change this year, and we have three things that we're gonna need to do that. First thing is, we're gonna centralize in a single platform. So right now, if you go look on the Open Raleigh site, you've got spatial data in one place, and you've got non-spatial data in another place. And from a citizen perspective, and from a knowledge perspective, you should really have to differentiate you should just know, I want to know about this and not have to think about what type of data it is. So we're going to be centralizing on a single platform. The other thing that we're going to do is we're going to start giving you more context along with the data. So it's not just a short description, but you know exactly the time frame, you know exactly how, when it's updated, you know what filters are applied, and you know what things we're doing with that data. So we use this data to X. And then the third thing we're doing is we're going to start putting out more stories. So as part of moving to a new data platform, we are gonna provide the context and the stories to go along with that, and really focus on the actions that we're taking. So what we're really looking to do is to enhance the data that we're providing, to enlighten folks, and to really change, to evoke change. And maybe it's a, you didn't think of something the same way anymore, maybe it came a realization of a problem or just a different thought process, but that's really where we're pushing. We also have an internal program going on where we're choosing an analytics tool for the city. And what we're trying to do is really streamline what we use in the city and what we provide to the public. So that it's one process. It's not this is over here and this is over there behind the curtain, but to really share and to be more transparent with our process. So that is the process that we're taking right now. Um, we're looking at four vendors and doing this huge POC that hopefully will be done soon. <laughs> so that we can pick a tool and start moving forward. Um, and then once that's done, we'll be able to also enhance our program. So expect a lot of changes on Open Raleigh in the next year. Thanks, Bonnie. Hey, City Camp, how's it going? Uh, my name's Daniel Dunn. I'm a business analyst uh, for the town of Chapel Hill. Uh, I help manage the Open Data Program alongside David Green uh, at the library. I'm gonna be here today. Uh, one of the unique things about the Chapel Hill Open Data Program is that it is managed out of the library. Uh, so libraries are trusted public institutions now. Uh, and 
our MO at Chapel Hill has been to publish as much raw data as possible without interpreting it for you. Uh, a culture shift we're seeing in the town right now is that uh, staff is actually asking for data. Uh, so uh, they're asking for data to make material, uh, material driven decisions, daily driven decisions, and that's really inspiring um, because it means staff is starting to realize the potential of data. Uh, so uh, along with that, uh, as we procure new systems, we're also taking a look at uh, our contracts uh, for our new systems. So we're including language that says, yes, the town doesn't own this data, and therefore the public then owns that data. Uh, so going along with that culture, uh, one of the things we're working on right now uh, to demonstrate value across the town is dashboards, real-time dashboards. Um, so we're actually going to be able to see in real time at the library uh, you know, how many books are checked out, how many patients are coming through the door, and really operationalizing that data in real time. And we're using this as a proof of concept, and hopefully if it's successful, uh, we will then uh, move that out to other departments and expand that. So uh, any open data program must be sustainable, and by sustainable I mean we don't have people manually uploading CSV files into our portal. Uh, so what we've done, of course, is you know, built automated processes, uh, and so our ETL scripts uh, to uh, transform the data and load it in our own data portal all, are all available on GitHub now. So if you're using Nextbus or any of the other systems we have, go ahead and fork it. Uh, please do. Um, public money, public code, amen, right? Um, so here's a quick plug before I close this up. Um, for a project from, that was originally funded uh, with a Bank Foundation grant. Um, so this will actually collect uh, anonymized visitor data and generate a heat map. Um, and what you can do, you can actually get uh, a Raspberry Pi. You know, um, so for less than $100 uh, per device, you can get a visitor count and a heat map of pretty much any room or building. And this was huge for us because we are uh, under financial constraints at the moment. Um, so we've had a few departments asking for sensors, and uh, this seemed to be a good uh, direction that we could go to meet that need without spending a whole bunch of money. Um, so uh, to close, feedback is welcome, critiques are welcome. Uh, I enjoy the tension between the public and the government. I think that's healthy. I think we need to continue that. So if you have any uh, negative feedback, positive feedback, <laughs> whatever, give it to me, please. Uh, we have two, or is, is Steven here? Aaron, Steven? Uh, so uh, Aaron in the back, she is our, if you want to raise your hand, she is our, uh, uh, one of our recent open data program uh, support folks. Uh, she's doing the heavy lifting on the coding. Uh, please talk to me or her and give us your feedback. Thank you very much. All right, so last one for this mega lightning talk. So my name is Ben Strauss. Uh, I am a GIS uh, analyst at Wake County, and I'm the technical lead in our open data site. So as my co-presenters have talked about, we're moving past just putting data out and we're talking about what can we do with the data. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is um, a tool used for developing apps based on open data. So what we're really trying to do is demonstrate to people that our open data is there for you to use. You know, it's one thing to just put it out there. Like we've said, I think all the journalists said this, putting it out there is great, but it's meaningless without use and without context, right? So through open data, in your app, you get a persistent data source. You get the data managed by us at the county. You know, we're doing the ETL every night to keep it updated. You don't have to do any of that. You don't have to bring it over local to your machine or your network. Um, a lot of our data sets are updated every night. Oh, we might move to more real-time things, as we said. So it takes the onus off of you as a developer to think about and worry about the data part and think more about the features and the design of your app, right? So some examples. This is NC Food Inspector, which you're going to see a full lightning talk on in a few minutes, but I'll just mention it here. This is a, an app that uses uh, data from Wake County's open data portal in an app that's not a Wake County app, but it uses Wake County data. And I'll let, I'll let Bill and Andre talk about what it does in a minute. 
Uh, another example here, this is a Wake County Library app, and again, it's not an official Wake County app. It was developed by uh, just a guy who works for NTDOT, and he had decided he wanted to, in his spare time, and I was an employee of NTDOT, in his spare time, he wanted to make an app. And so he used our library data from our open data portal, and he made an app where you can go and check out the library information, pictures, hours, events. And again, it uses our data, but it's not our app. So, I'm going to talk about this new tool in Esri's open data platform. Uh, in Wake County, we use the Esri platform for open data because the Consumer GS department we already had Esri available to us. I know there's also an API for Open Data Soft or Socrata or whatever API or whatever open data platform you're using. I'm going to talk about Esri's because that's what I know. <laughs> so, uh, Esri's Open Data 2.0 platform has this new API Explorer, which makes it really easy for you to go to a data set, generate a URL, and drop it into your app. So when you come to a data set, this is our, uh, a parks data set from our data portal. Click on this, open, this API Explorer. Um, you can automatically choose uh, a query. So I have a query here, I'm looking for parks that have disc golf available at the park. And then the fields that I want output, and it generates a URL for you. So you don't need to worry about figuring out uh, all the specific specificities of that URL. So next you can choose spatial inputs. Esri is a spatial platform. If you, want to, if you want the API to return the geometry of the point locations to you, you can do that. Spatial filters, et cetera, et cetera. And everything you do here is reflected automatically in your query URL up there. Again, uh, the last screen here, option outputs. Just a bunch more options for um, distinct features, et cetera, et cetera. And again, your URL queries can get really, really complicated, but you don't have to worry about that. You just click the buttons and it generates it for you. And you, you just take that URL and drop it in your app. Makes it really simple. So once you generate that URL, how do you make an app? Some basic options. Um, leaflet, Mapbox, or open source, Google Maps. The Esri has its own JavaScript API, which plays really nicely with it, obviously. Or, uh, you know, it pains me to say it because I'm a GS person, but you can make something without a map at all. <laughs> The data is just data. It's a JSON response, right? It comes with geometry if you want it. If you don't want geometry, you don't need to have geometry, right? So, that is my presentation. What we're gonna do now is talk about what's, what are we doing now for open data? So we're gonna kind of, yeah, we just wanna get everybody up here. Yeah, we can everyone stand up. So we're gonna talk about, real quickly, in the last, um, I don't know, two minutes here, three minutes, what, what now for open data? What's coming next? What do we see happening in the next few years with open data? So, um, my co-presenter is going to talk about you know, real-time access, transparency, data data. I want to mention uh, multi-jurisdictional open data as well. You know, we're, we're all up here as representatives of open data platforms from local government. Um, we have, on Wake's site, we've federated with a number of our local municipalities to bring open data into one spot so that our consumers don't get the, the multi-jurisdictional fatigue of having to track down what data sets belong to what municipalities. So moving forward, that's going to be important. And uh, I know at Wake, the other thing we're looking at doing is real-time dashboards and real-time data updates, as you mentioned. Yeah, I'm, I would echo Sam's sentiments from before about um, how uh, the government is going to start using data more and more. And that's the push we're going to see. We're going to operationalize the data. It's not just going to be this uh, method to facilitate transparency, um, but it will be a push to actually get people making better decisions. So the city's commitment in creating my department sort of shows what they're going to be doing with data in the future and picking an analytic tool and standardizing on it and really reevaluating our open data program. So um, like some of those who said, we definitely want your feedback and comments and things that we're missing that we don't have out there in our program and things you'd like to see. You'll see a lot of new things for us in the coming year. Um, and finally, I think, and I was fortunate enough to get to give a similar talk a couple of days ago that Jason was at, um, where I talked about this, and I just think rapid engagement, honestly. I think more and more people are going to be engaging with open data. We're going to be communicating more around open data. And the conversations are going to be happening faster and in more meaningful ways. And with that said, I want to make sure to point out that Noel and Stephen, who are both from the Sunlight Foundation, are here. Stephen, I know, is going to be talking tomorrow. But they just released a tactical engagement guide. Is that correct? 
And so if you want to talk about engagement around open data, definitely talk to them. And if you want to talk about engagement with us, here's our information. We'll be around and feel free to get in contact with us. Thank you all very much. So um, the question was pretty much what work is being done to standardize data and kind of bring together data across multiple jurisdictions so that they're in a common format. And so um, I don't know if all of us, I don't know if Chapel Hill was a little work city and then, and then Wake's a county, but um, I know, I mean, I know we're having more conversations now about it. I know we have um, a Slack now, uh, data Slack for North Carolina cities where we talk about these kind of things. And I know stuff like, not to plug another partner, but data.world, um, platforms like that allow us to bring together data across multiple, from multiple places and at least see what needs to be done with that data to kind of put it in a common format. So I know that's what we're doing so far. Yeah, I'll just say it's from the county level. Um, what we're doing is, you know, if you're looking for a data set from Raleigh, you can go to Raleigh's open data site and find that there. You can also come to our open data site, the, the counties, because at, in our county portal, we've federated Raleigh's data, Wake Forest's data, Cary's data, and a few Quaker Regions data, and we're working on other municipalities as well. So we're, we're making an effort to get it all in a kind of a one step shop. Right. So. Anybody else? Yep. What kind of challenges do you all have to face with getting departments in your city to actually make some data public? <laughs> yeah, so the question was what challenges we had in getting um, groups in our government to agree to share their data publicly. Uh, I'll say, without naming names, it's sometimes a challenge to do that. Um, the folks are attached to their data, that there's plenty of data sets that have been you know, with, withheld for a long period of time for whatever reason, whether it be privacy reason or just because um, you know, they don't feel like they should be public information. So what we do is meet with the, the stakeholders and the data holders and explain to them what open data is and how we can work with them to put it out there and we explain to them you know, we're only going to put out what you want us to put out. So it, it's an effort and it's an ongoing effort and it's, you know, it's not always easy, but we're, we're making that work gradually. <laughs> So from our perspective, we're changing the focus. Before it was um, run by Open Data Manager and their whole focus was Open Data. Now that internal data is also in the same group, we help them fix their stuff and work on their stuff internally and then say, hey, can we take this subset or this picture or whatever and release it to the public? So we're focused on their internal and then sharing external. Instead of going straight external, it allows them to get comfortable with us and the process and a little bit more engagement. Yeah, I would add to that, um, that demonstrating value helps. And also, uh, what we have done is kind of pointed to the police department. Uh, the police department has actually come to us and said, yes, we want to publish this data. So hey, the police, the police department is saying, you know, what, what's, uh, what's the issue here with this other <laughs> <laughs> data set? So. so two quick things. One, uh, just real talk. Any 14-year-old now can find your data if they really want to and they'll get it. <laughs> That's not how I would pitch it, but if it nothing works, you can just say that to them. But yeah, I think what they were saying about, and this kind of goes into his move to Open Data 2.0, um, yes, there's this thing on transparency and people wanting to 
audit government and figure out how to better government and find things that are being done wrong, but a lot of people just want open data so they can help, or they want open data so that they can do their part, and whatever that means to them. And so one thing I kind of struggle with at times myself is the cynicism we have for residents at times when it comes to data and public information. And so I think if we can transition local government, state government, federal government away from this cynicism of what residents can do and instead focus on the benefits they can bring, um, I think you really make a transition there into what open data can bring as far as value to both the residents and the entity that's releasing it. One more question? What is being done, if anything, about um, governments using the data for not so good purposes? You know, can it be tied directly to uh, traceability of the data because like, stats and are easily to are easily manipulated to say whatever you want them to say? Right, so pretty much what are we doing about bad actors in government with data? Um, and this is a good point, and especially as we move into data-driven decision-making and value-driven decision-making and we do performance metrics, um, again, I won't name names, but you know there are people who are fudging numbers to show that their department's producing more than they are. Um, and here's what I will say, you can fudge your numbers, but if our Resident smart enough to know if you're not doing your job, and they will come to a council meeting and let you know, and then somebody will do the due diligence. Uh, and, and again, that, I think it goes back to being cynical about what residents see and don't see, but I think having honest conversations about using data not to audit departments, but to better departments, I think is a really key point and a really important transition we need to make as far as how we have this conversation about data. So there's a stewardship part of this. We don't actually own the data. The citizens who we service really own the data. So it's all about accountability and standardization for us in order to have that. So if we're using certified data within the city to make our business decisions, that same certified data should be available on the public site. And so there's really no way to go in between. If you have the data, the visualization, and the narrative all together, then there's no way to fudge it, right? You can look through the pieces and figure it out. So we're relying kind of what Sam is saying is that the education, especially in this area, on the citizens and the people using our data is actually really high, right? There's people who are taking it and, and making informed decisions from it. So we have that accountability on us to do that internally as well and to share those same best practices to our open data program. Yeah, I can speak for the Chapel Hill insofar as uh, if it is illegal to publish, uh, we are going to publish it, uh, so if we provide the raw data. So if there's any need to go back and verify those numbers or arithmetic on anything, you can come and see that raw data. So what we have is what we publish, um, and as long as it's not protected information, we're going to publish it. Okay, in true city camp fashion, I forgot to say a few things earlier, <laughs> so I'm going to say them now. Uh, we like to be social, so um, both in person, because that's the whole value of doing events like this, but also online, so um, hopefully you're, a lot of you are smart and figured it out already, but our social media hashtag is uh, hashtag citycampnc, um, so take pictures, tweet what you like, uh, give the speaker some love, uh, and when you hear things that, um, that they're saying during their talks. Um, and I forgot something else which I forgot to write down. <laughs> Does anyone remember what it is? <laughs> yeah, well, we're live streaming. Uh, we'll have all the slides online later on, so don't worry. But we like when you take pictures of slides and tweak them. That's a, that's a good thing. Um, yeah, I totally like that again. So anyway, we'll, um, we're going to come back around 7, right, right around 7. This says 7 to 5, but we're like a little ahead of schedule. Um, we totally went off script, so we didn't plan for the questions, so thanks for having great questions, and thanks for the, the Mega Lightning Talk speakers for being able to ad hoc and, and address those questions. Um, they're used to that anyway, being you know, under pressure. So anyway, uh, we've got uh, another group of Lightning Talk speakers coming up after this, so recharge on the fuel, uh, the pizza, and the beverages, and we'll see you here back in a little bit. Thanks.